Welcome to the Church in the 21st Century Center book launch for Catholic Spiritual Practices, A Treasury of Old and New, edited by Professors Colleen Griffith and Tom Groom. Catholic Spiritual Practice is the 11th book in the C21 book series, um, and it's a concrete of example of how the church hands on the faith. And handing on the faith is our theme for the semester extending out of our fall issue of C21 Resources Magazine, which Tom Groom guest edited with us. Catholic Spiritual Practices is the first book venture for C21 to emerge entirely out of our magazine, out of C21 Resources. In 2009, Colleen Griffith guest edited the Catholic spirituality and practice. And this now marks a new partnership with Paraclete Press. Not only that, it's, this is C21's first commercial book venture, which means that the book will be in bookstores across the nation starting next week, but it'll also be published in an e-book format. You can tell we're quite excited about this. I want to express um, our gratitude to Paraclete Press um, for partnering with C21 in this endeavor and for printing uh, such a lovely book. And I welcome John Sweeney, associate publisher from Paraclete Press. John, would you say a few words? Thanks, Eric. It's great to be with you all. I came in from Evanston, Illinois, where I live with my wife and family. I'm the editor-in-chief at Paraclete Press. Just briefly to say, we've been around for about 30 years. We're actually a Massachusetts publisher. You may or may not have heard of us. Midsize, we're on Cape Cod in Orleans, Massachusetts. So come visit us sometime if you're ever out there in the summer. But we're there all year long. And uh, this book is terrific for our list because we publish occasional theological, philosophical works, but the core of what we do is spirituality and spirituality in practice. So uh, we, we wanted to produce a beautiful book. I hope you agree, and I hope you give it to every, every confirmand and every gift occasion possible because it would be great to see this, uh, this work reach a wide audience, so we're going to do our best to do that. Also, just a brief word. Um, I often feel like I need to be a missionary for the book business. Uh, we finished our our fiscal year about a month ago, and we sold 20% more physical books last year than we ever, ever have before. So if anyone tells you that the day of the physical book is over, uh, for those of us who still love them, uh, it's not true. Don't believe it. And uh, that's part of why we wanted to create a beautiful thing here, too, as well. So thanks for letting me join you. Thank you. John. Mm. Thank you, John. Um, I'd like to introduce our speakers for this evening, the co-editors of Catholic Spiritual Practices, who, um, by the way, happen to be married to each other. <laughs> Colleen Griffith is an associate professor of the practice of spirituality and director of spirituality studies at the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry. She holds her doctorate in theology from Harvard University Divinity School. She specializes in the intersection of theology and spirituality an intersection that is reflected in her publications and public lectures. In addition to teaching and writing, Colleen directs and oversees the Postmaster's Certificate Program in the Practice of Spirituality. Colleen is also editor of another C21 book, Prophetic Witnesses, Catholic Women's Strategies for Reform. Welcome, Colleen. Tom Groom holds the equivalent of an MDiv from St. Patrick's Seminary in Carlow, Ireland, an MA from Fordham University and a doctoral degree in religious education from Union Theological Seminary at Columbia University. Tom has served for 36 years as a faculty member of theology and religious education at Boston College. He currently serves as a chairperson for the Department of Religious Education and Pastoral Ministry at the School of Theology and Ministry. Tom has published numerous books, his most recent being Will There Be Faith? A New Vision for Educating and Growing Disciples. 
Tom is also the primary author of various religious textbook series, most recently the Coming to Faith series. As I mentioned, Tom also is the guest editor of the current C21 uh, Resources magazine, Handing on the Faith. Tom and Colleen will speak uh, for each for a bit and then engage us in a spiritual practice. Uh, we will conclude about 6.30 with a reception and book signing in the rotunda. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to our speakers. Thanks, Eric, and thanks to all of you for being here to get this book launched. Um, special appreciation goes to Paraclete Press because they have had an ongoing commitment to publishing high quality work in spirituality for decades. And special thanks to them for their persuasiveness in convincing Tom and me to take this project on in the first place. And they did a spectacular job with the book from cover to cover, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Thanks to C21 as well for making this project go as smoothly as it did and for lining up this wonderful evening. And thanks to you, Tom, for working as my co-editor on this volume. You know, we have been in the area of theology, spirituality, and education together for years, and yet this is our first joint project. So it's great to see the fruits of it tonight. So why a book on spiritual practice? Well, as you know, this book had its genesis in the C21 Resources Spring Issue devoted to spiritual practices that I had the good fortune of guest editing. And it generated this unprecedented, uh, unprecedented amount of interest that really reflected people's hunger to explore this particular dimension of their faith. So the barrage of requests for literally thousands of copies of this issue came as somewhat of a surprise to everyone connected with the project including myself, and yet it probably shouldn't have. Because at this time in our ecclesial landscape, contemporary Catholics are very eager to move toward greater levels of spiritual maturity and to foster an adult faith. And Catholics in particular really want to learn about the spiritual practices that serve to foster this desire. Now the wonderful thing is that Catholic spirituality is so rich in practice, something underheralded at times, though the realm of spiritual practice is one of the real strong points of Catholicism. You see, there are myriad resources in our tradition, long-standing practices that have deepened and evolved over time, that have nurtured and continue to nurture the spiritual lives of people for centuries in powerfully formative ways. And this little book represents but a tip of the iceberg regarding the possibilities that are within our tradition. As we think about what constitutes religious identity these days, that's a big topic, we all do well to reconnect theory and practice more intentionally. The content of Christian faith, after all, is forever more than its belief system. It includes not only beliefs, but the spiritual practices of Christians over time. Christian discipleship has and will always require coherence of belief and practice. And while spiritual practices may be a somewhat short shrifted aspect of the way in which we have historically handed on the faith, they are absolutely central to it. It is always the integration of thought and practice that defines the religious self. Thus, regular and intentional exercises, spiritual practices, cumulatively serve to create a particular consciousness, greater levels of awareness, more energy for action for justice, greater attraction to the truth, and courage with respect to what needs to happen in the face of that truth. Practices like prayer, forgiveness, hospitality, discernment, these all highlight something about God, something about ourselves, about the world, and about the other. And what practices highlight cannot be reduced to verbal description alone, 
because practices witness to the affective as well as to the cognitive. They witness to the full bodily intelligence of faith. Yes, consideration of practices gives us a chance to think about the lived body in faith. In fact, engagement in practices is where bodily learning of faith gets demonstrated. For too long, we've been entrapped in a mind-body, soul-body hierarchy. In the spiritual practices of our faith, the bodies of persons move front and center, and we come to see the embodied ways that Christians have of organizing their being in the world, their ways of relating to one another in community, their styles of prayer, their works for justice, how they create beauty, how they practice hope. This is the realm of practice. And we've got to include this realm more deliberately as we think about our religious identity as Catholic Christians. As all of us here tonight attempt to live more fully in response to God's gift of life abundant, spiritual practices will be key. The intention that we bring to spiritual practice matters, as does the visible grammar of the spiritual practice itself. And hopefully this little book will provide access to both the intentions that people bring to spiritual practices and the visible grammar of the practices themselves. Practices that have withstood the test of time and continue to evolve as they are adapted in new historical and cultural contexts. Well, here to talk about the importance of drawing from the storeroom both the old and the new with respect to spiritual practice is my co-editor and husband, Thomas Grimm. Well done. Well, thanks, thanks, Colleen. And I'm going to remain seated because we're going to do a spiritual practice, and I think it'll be, it'll be uh, more appropriate for me to be sitting with you as we try to do that. So good evening, everybody, and thank you indeed for joining us. And we are excited about uh, this book, and it is, as Colleen said, our first venture together. It'll also be our last. Oh, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> a joke, that was just a joke. Uh, we have enjoyed a great deal working on it, and, uh, and I want to begin by thanking, I think I have three women that I want to thank for this book. I want to thank Colleen because really she did the heavy work of assembling the much, many of the essays that are in here, many of the practices that are in here, and of originally collecting them into that issue of C21 resources. And so in a sense, it was easy for us to simply add a little, take one away, or add a few, and write a kind of a closing essay. So I really had a free ride uh, with this book, and I'm delighted to be associated with it, and I want to thank Colleen for her wonderful work on it, and what a joy it was, truly a joy to work on it together. Uh, secondly, the second woman I want to thank is Karen Kiefer. Karen is the Associate Director of C21 Resources. Now, I could mention Bob Newton and Eric as well, but I won't. Uh, it, they were very helpful, but Karen really was the one who had the vision for this book and who kept coming back to myself and Colleen and saying, you've got to do this. This would be a wonderful, um, resource to the life of the church and to the faith life of people and to our spiritual practices. And I suppose in, in the aftermath of Vatican II, that, that we kind of were sobered in our attitude toward many of our, many, there weren't so much spiritual practices as popular pieties. And the church wanted us to recenter uh, our faith on the, on the liturgy, on the scriptures and so on. Uh, and in a sense, at least some of the, of the popular pieties kind of receded from center stage from the kind of primary role they had enjoyed. And that was wise and, and um, uh, probably a gift, and I'm sure a gift to, the, to our faith and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But now that we're 50 years on from the council, uh, I think it's time for us to reclaim and to uh, repossess and to refurbish as needed many of those old practices and the new ones that are emerging as well. Because we, as Colleen said so uh, movingly, we certainly need them. They're integral to our faith. So Karen had that vision and saw to it and monitored it and, and uh, even down to, the, to helping with the cover. And I must say, when I saw it online, I didn't particularly like it. But then when you see it in gold, 
and you realize that you could easily melt this down and, and, uh, and make, make money out of it. I'm kidding, of course. Uh, it really is a goal. A tra it reflects a real treasury of our faith and that, the, uh, and that we're, we're always entitled to have access uh, to the treasury. It sometimes reminds me of the grandparents. This actually happened in my family. My grandparents lived on a farm out in the middle of Ireland. And uh, they got a fit of, they said, all this old furniture that's around the place, you know, we got to get the new furniture. You know, that good tubular steel stuff that they have now in the stores. And so they kind of cleared out the kitchen and they cleared out the living room and then the dining room and put a lot of the old furniture up in the attic. And uh, we're going to throw it away, but said, well, maybe, you know, we put it up. So the old armchairs and all kinds of tables and recliners and what have you went up in the attic, and the new furniture, the nice fancy furniture, came into the home, into our grandparents' home. But guess what happened? Well, about 30 or 40 years later, a bunch of the grandkids went up to the attic and said, hey, this is valuable, you know, we could sell this, we could use this, or I'm not selling it, I'm taking some from my house, and I'm taking some from my house. So their old furniture all got divvied up among the grandkids, but it was almost like they came back and reclaimed it and recognized the value of it, and that uh, it was still a marvelous uh, legacy to be able to inherit. And of course, the fact that they could inherit it was because they were inside of the family, they were within the home, they were within the the community still. And so that's the best of belonging to a rich old uh, tradition like Catholic Christian faith because we can always go to the attic or the basement or wherever they've left stuff last and find it, refurbish it, refurbish it, and indeed find life in it again. Karen had that vision for it. We thank Karen. Then I want to, want to thank my own mom, and she's long gone home to God. As the poet Yeats put, put it, she hurried home to God uh, after raising nine kids, you wouldn't blame her really. She more than deserved to go home to God. Um, I was the youngest of them, but anyhow. Um, but in many ways it was my mother who taught me uh, not only the practices of our faith, but the value of practicing our faith. And that indeed our faith has to be embodied, as Colleen said so well. It has to shape our very being, and being both as a noun and as a verb. In other words, who we are and how we live. And, and that the practices are essential to that. If you were to ask Paulo Freire, one of my own great mentors in life, how do you raise Christians? How do you form Christians? He would say, give them Christian things to do. And if they do Christian things, then they'll become Christian. So often, we often tend to think of that the source of our faith is in our beliefs. But as Colleen said so well, it's pro probably more primarily in our practices and the things, in the things we do. Uh, so thanks to Colleen, to Karen, and to my good mom. Um, I wasn't too long in this country and I was reading a theology book on a plane and I always tell my neighbors not to be too impressed by that, you know, my co-travelers, when they see you reading a book about Jesus or something, they always think you must be holy and I say don't presume upon my sanctity at all, uh, I, I do this for a living and uh, so then they relax. And, um, but this is about, I don't know, 35, 40 years, 35 years ago I suppose. and. Um, just after I made my first Holy Communion, it was actually. Uh, but they, they, um, um, the person beside me started talking when, they, when the uh, uh, lunch cart came. It was a lunch cart in those days. Now it's a peanut uh, cart. But they, they started chatting about faith and so on. And then they just kind of threw this question at me. He said, well, are you a practicing Catholic? And I remember I'd never heard the phrase before. Are you a practicing Catholic? And I thought to myself, now, practicing Catholic? Because the village I came from, you were a Catholic and you practiced. And uh, it was as simple as that. I mean, there was no choice about whether you did or you didn't. I remember Joe Kane, an old fellow that worked on my grandfather's farm, uh, tried to quit going to Mass. And my grandfather took him aside and told him in no uncertain terms, Joe, you go to Mass every Sunday, because if you don't, and the, if the crops fail, we'll know who to blame in this village, you know? So Joe went to Mass. I think Joe was a devout atheist, really, but he went to Mass every Sunday. So we practiced our faith. There's no such thing as non-practicing Catholics. Um, 
And I, but I took the woman's phrase, I took the woman's question literally, and I said, well, practice, yeah, I, I'd say I do. I practice it all right, yeah, but not very good at it, but I keep practicing and maybe eventually I will become good at it. But in a sense, she was hitting the nail on the head about something very constitutive about our Catholic Christian identity, that it is indeed something that we have to practice, that the faith has to be put to work in the ordinary and every day of our lives. And this, this aspect of Catholic faith, I believe, was somewhat tested and perhaps even clarified and deepened even by the polemics of the Reformation. Uh, because the good reformers were indeed favoring Romans and saying we're justified by faith, faith alone saves. And when our Catholic tradition regathered at the great council of Trent, it, it said yes, it, it, it quoted James of course, chapter two, verse 17, that faith without works is dead. But it didn't just quote James, that, that in a sense, it's, it's the whole tradition of Jesus of Nazareth, that this faith of ours has to be put into practice. It has to be lived. And it runs throughout the whole, all of the, all of the gospels. Now we could pile the quotes high and deep at this stage. Um, but you hear him saying, you hear Jesus saying, it's not the one who says, Lord, Lord, who enters the reign of God, is the one who does the will of my Father. It's Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 or 16. Um, or uh, if you live according to my teachings, this is John 8, 31, I believe. If you live according to my teachings, you're truly my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now, if he was a good Greek philosopher, he would say, if you really believe it and know it, you'll be a disciple and you'll live it. But actually, he put it the other way around. If you live it, you become a disciple, and you'll know it in a profound way that will set you free. And as he said, the quotes go on and on. Or John chapter 8, verse 12, he says, I am the light of the world. But then he immediately adds, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. But to have the light of life, you have to, you have to follow the way. Uh, even when his mother and his family came looking for him to I always think Mary came to bring him home before he got into bigger trouble. And, um, but he said to them, look, whoever, whoever hears the word of God and keeps it is my family. And it goes on. You, as I said, we can pile up the quotes that this faith of ours has to be lived. When he said to the, to the lawyer, go and do likewise, or do as I have done, and so on. So it has to be a way of life. And then it, the spiritual practices, of course, don't exhaust the call to discipleship, far from it. Now, the call to discipleship can often be crafted around spiritual practices, and we do that within the book, like hospitality and forgiveness and so on. But the, the, the spiritual practices can sustain us in the life of discipleship. And it's probably not possible to sustain and grow in a life of discipleship to Jesus Christ without good practices. And as Colleen says, the blessing is that we have them galore. And if you don't like the ones in here, there's hundreds of others. This is only, as Colleen said, the tip of the iceberg. I do like to think it's the tip of the iceberg, which of course is the more visible part of the iceberg, but there's lots beneath the water as well, and lots in our old traditions, in our cultural traditions. Uh, we didn't do much in here with, with uh, seasonal practices, so Advent and Lent and Christmas and all of the rich traditions in Lithuanian Catholicism, Polish Catholicism, German Catholicism, French, Italian, American Catholicism, emer the, the, the great emerging traditions that we have. Um, so it's, 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 uh, I think it'll be a real resource uh, for us uh, and for the re-nurturing and the nurturing of people in faith. I think you could give this book um, to a child for their first Eucharist uh, confirmation. You could give it to a grandchild. You could give it to a grandparent. Uh, Easter, Christmas, uh, St. Patrick's Day, whatever. Uh, it's, uh, and we're not uh, just trying to buy those shoes for Teddy we really think it's a terribly worthwhile a terribly worthwhile piece and as I said something that we can return to and reclaim the subtitle a treasure old and new there's a lovely line in Matthew's gospel chapter 13 verse 50 51 52 where, he, where Jesus says that the scribe learned in the reign of God is like the head of a household who can take from the treasury or from the storeroom and we use, we favor the word treasury, both the old and the new. And that's what we've tried to do, to take from the treasury both the old and the new. Now, in fact, a lot of the new 
are very old, but refurbished or reclaimed. Things like Lexio Divina, Centering Prayer. Go back to the third, fourth century in the Desert Fathers and Mothers, and then to the Benedictine tradition and so on, coming down through the, eight, through the centuries. So that, but they're, they're new in the sense they're new to us, and very often, as I said, they're also kind of recast to be mere, perhaps more appropriate to our time. So the old examination of conscience that all of us were urged to do before we went to bed at night to look back over the day and to examine our conscience. It's now recast as an exam, examine of consciousness where we become aware of the movements of God's spirit and uh, how we respond or fail to respond, a rich tradition that comes to us, of course, out of the Ignatian, uh, out of Ignatian spirituality. So um, we're proud of it, we're delighted with it. We think it'll be a service uh, to the life of our faith and to the good practices thereof. But as Carl said, why just talk about it? We thought we might do a practice with you uh, and it is a lovely one that's in here. Oh, let me go through, let me just go through some of the, of the before I read into the practice itself. Let me just whip through uh, some of the essays just to whet your appetite, as it were. Well, we might, I may say a word very briefly about each one of them. And also the authors, the authors in here are like a list of who's who in contemporary Catholic theology and spirituality. And I think that's significant because our spirituality should always be grounded in good theology. In fact, spiritualities that are not grounded in good theology often easily merge to become pious practices that perhaps at times can border on the, on the superstitious. So the grounding of them in good theological thinking and scholarship is simply imperative, and indeed, we've been able to do that. But for example, the first section, part one, uh, is practices of prayer, and then we have practices of care, and then we have practices of spiritual growth. Very briefly, the Lord's Prayer, a lovely review, a lovely meditation on it by N.T. Wright, one of the leading New Testament scholars in the world. Uh, I reread it myself this morning. It's an absolutely inspiring uh, encouragement to us to retrieve and reclaim our practice of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, Praying with the Saints, Elizabeth Johnson, one of the finest theologians of our time, her beautiful book of some years ago, Friends of God and, and uh, Friends of God and prophets. and prophets, Friends of God and Prophets, it's an excerpt from there. Um, they, then the Jesus Prayer is in there, uh, Joseph Wong, a great uh, Benedictine, uh, that lovely Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. And then treat, and some uh, traditions add, on mercy, have mercy on me, a sinner. Um, and then the mantra-like way of praying that over and over, uh, the Jesus prayer, again, goes back to the second, third, they, it's, it's in, the, in the dawn of the history of the church. We really don't know who originated it. We do know a little about who popularized it and so on. Intercessory prayer, the tradition of intercessory prayer, Anne Olenov and Barry Olenov. And writing as Anne Olenov was a brilliant uh, interlocutor between psychi psychiatry and spirituality, were probably one of the finest in, the, in recent history. But talking about the importance of intercessory prayer and how it can connect us as a community and to pray for the living and to pray for the dead and to pray for friends and family, but to pray for enemies as well and people we don't like and how it can change our attitude. And uh, it's a spectacular little essay. Centering prayer, I love the fact that Joe Sandman is, works in advancement at Seton Hall. And isn't it fun that Joe uh, gets himself to practice uh, his centering prayer. Thomas Keating and um, uh, the Trappist monks especially have been leaders in reclaiming centering prayer, that kind of deep attempt to enter into contemplation, into the mystical presence and to experience the mystical presence of God. An essay then on the rosary, which I edited, which I wrote myself many years ago, actually. I wrote it shortly after the Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, uh, initiated this, the five um, uh, mysteries, the luminous mysteries of light, because I'd written an essay actually critical of the lack of the historical Jesus in the rosary. Remember, uh, the, five, fifth, the fifth joyful mystery is the finding in the temple when he was, a, when he was 12 years old. The, the fifth joyful mystery. Then the next mystery, the first sorrowful mystery, was the agony in the garden. So we literally skipped in our Christology, the operative Christology in the life of our people very often skipped the life of Jesus. We went straight from when he was 12 and 
taken home by his mom and the poor guy was so scared he didn't leave home again until he was 30 years of age and here he is now uh, in the garden, agony in the garden and we skipped over his life. And so it's a real gift, I believe, when, when John Paul II uh, proclaimed those five luminous mysteries based on the life of Jesus, wedding feast of Cana, uh, the baptism and so on, institution of the Eucharist. And, and uh, so it gives us a broader Christology and I think the rosary can still be a wonderful mantra-like prayer uh, for us. You don't have to stop and think about it very much. I was taught by my grandmother to say it when I couldn't get to sleep, and it still puts me to sleep uh, at night. If I wake in the middle of the night, I'll very often start the rosary. And my grandmother's promise was, it's enough to get it started. Don't expect to finish it, but the angels will finish it for you. It was a pious thought, but I often think when I fall asleep in the third or fourth mystery that Somebody up there will finish it for me. And then Liturgy of the Hours by Elizabeth Collier. Elizabeth's a young theologian at the uh, Loyola uh, Chicago, and, but she des describes herself as a Gen Xer, as a Gen X Catholic, but it's just fascinating to see this young woman going back to the old tradition of the Liturgy of the Hours and praying uh, the Matins, Lauds, Vespers, or whatever she can manage to pray in any given day. Colleen has an essay then on praying with images, calling us back to the rich tradition of iconic prayer and praying with and through icons, not just looking at them, but looking through them to the great mystery in the presence of God that they represent to us. A rich tradition, of course, in Eastern Catholicism, but certainly should be accessible to uh, Western Christians as well. And then that section ends with a bunch of prayers uh, that I put together or collected. And basically what we review there uh, are, the, are the obvious ones, the, the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be to the Father, of course, um, the Prayer of the Holy Spirit, the come, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, morning prayer, a night prayer, grace before meals, an act of contrition, a Hail Holy Queen, St. Patrick's breastplate, uh, just to be ecumenical, uh, reflection of St. Teresa of Avila, Christ I, has no body now but ours, prayer of St. Francis, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace, and then, of course, we had to do as well, and we're happy to do, the sushi pay of St. Ignatius of Loyola, take Lord and receive, etc. all my liberty. That concludes that section of it. The practices of care, then, that, that are in here, living the sacramental principle, Esther Duvall, a great uh, exponent of Celtic spirituality, uh, talking about finding God in the midst of nature and creation and coming to see God in all things. Practicing hospitality, Anna Maria Pineda, uh, Sister of Mercy, teaches professor at the uh, University of Santa Clara, and she reflects there on Los Posados, the lovely tradition, especially in Advent, of uh, coming out of uh, Mexican Catholicism especially, of uh, welcoming the stranger, hospitality, what that means, not just at Christmas time when we welcome the Christ child, but indeed welcoming the stranger. It's such a, a, a pressing topical issue, the whole issue of immigration and so on in our, in our society this time. Practicing forgiveness by Marjorie Thompson. Family life as spiritual with Wendy Wright. Wendy teaches at the University of Creighton and is probably one of the finest exponents of family spirituality in our US Catholic Church today. And for, the, for those of you who know it well, with the right attitude and the right approach, whether you're doing the dishes or changing a diaper, uh, it can be a spiritual practice. And, uh, uh, especially if approached appropriately. Practical care for the environment, uh, a statement from the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, that we have an environmental spirituality running through the tradition. You find it in many traditional spiritualities, uh, Celtic spirituality, for example, uh, Franciscan spirituality, but I suppose we've never had the capacity to destroy our environment before to the level at which we have it now. So raising consciousness about that and indeed making that part of our responsibility is, is an important spiritual practice. Then we practice of spiritual growth, the last section, we do the Ignatian exam, and I'll just read them out to you. Uh, I won't comment on the authors, maybe I will on one. Uh, the Ignatian examine, the examine of consciousness, the spirits, importance of spiritual direction, finding a soul friend, retreats, of course, Lexio Divina, which we'll come back to, the practice of discernment, that rich Ignatian process of making decisions uh, in the presence of God, Eucharistic adoration, something that's coming back in popularity, and Father Brian Daly, and I'll mention it just because he just recently received this very prestigious 
award as a uh, senior Catholic theologian being uh, conferred or uh, given to him at the Vatican on the 22nd of October by the Pope himself. Uh, Brian Daly, a former colleague of ours here at Boston College and at Western Jesuit School of Theology, and uh, is the author of that essay on Eucharistic Adoration. The Angelus, and then I do a bunch of, of um, more popular pieties, The Angelus, The Stations of the Cross, uh, Thanksgiving After Holy Communion, and uh, just lay out a little of the history of them, and they're great old practices. Um, fasting, Joan Chittister, uh, Sister Joan Chittister, one of the finest, I suppose, commentators and spiritual uh, authors of our time on the importance of fasting and the kind of solidarity and sense of uh, responsibility that fasting can give us. And then at the end, uh, Barbara Radke, our colleague here at Boston College, um, has an essay on spiritual practices and how the Facebook and Twitter and the whole digital age and the information technology can be a resource to us in our spirituality. And I suppose that's a, that's a learning curve for me, but I believe Barbara, and uh, she's a very credible witness of that. And then I end with a little essay called Keep On Practicing, You'll Get Better At It. And my favorite story is the one, I, th I think they have it on the cover, of the young woman who, uh, and Catholicism I think is very like this, uh, this young woman who had a, a, an audition at Carnegie Hall and uh, she got off the subway at 57th and 7th in downtown Manhattan. I was a little disoriented and she saw an old gentleman coming along with a violin under his arm, violin case, so she presumed. And so she went up to him and she said, sir, can you tell me how to get to Carnegie Hall? And of course, you know the answer. He said, practice, practice, practice. And I think Catholicism is very like that. It's practice, practice, practice. And we keep practicing. Maybe eventually we get very good at it. Let me invite you to a reflective uh, exercise that maybe give you a little a tidbit, a taste of what is here. And if, you, if, the, if the handout helps, you can use it. We have about 15 minutes. So if you're game, I am, and maybe relax and maybe put the papers aside. I'll walk us through it. Um, that might be better. It, it's the great practice. Let me say a couple of words about it, then we'll move into it, and then we will pause at least twice as we go through it, and I'll invite you to have a word with the neighbor, what you're hearing from the text. Basically, Lexio Divina, it's divine reading or, or, or uh, uh, holy reading, spiritual reading. Um, goes way back to the, to the desert fathers and mothers of that third, fourth century, and then is taken up, especially in the Benedictine tradition. And in a sense, it's a way of ruminating on the Word of God. Now, to be honest, I try to do it myself. I don't get to do it every day, but I do it probably three or four times a week. And I don't take very long with it. Now, this is so don't, don't take me as an example at all, but take me as a sample rather than an example. Um, but it can be done, I think, in about 12, 15 minutes. Uh, and it, the best time to do it, I find, is the morning. And I simply take at, at the readings of the day, the scripture readings, and if you don't have a little booklet with them, you get them on USCCB, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops web, website gives the readings. And I go, I go through the readings, and then I, I pick a couple of verses, a verse or two, usually not more than that, that said something to me, and, or that seemed to ring true, or maybe have a word of God uh, somehow for my life that day. And then I simply take my time with it and I go through these, these movements, as it were. And the old Latin words for them were the lexio, where you read it the first time and you kind of just notice what stands out. Then you move to meditatio. Now this is the version of it that's fa my favorite. And there's, it's, well, there, uh, there are other versions and it's not the very traditional version. I also add to it the word axio, an invitation to action and decision. I learned that in a third world context where I encountered people in community as de base type of community, based Christian communities, who always ended not in prayer or axio, but in axio, and an invitation to do something with the wisdom that had emerged for them as a word of God that, that, in that encounter. Um, so there's, there's lexio, meditatio, meditation, contemplatio, I usually do next, the contemplation, and then move to oratio, which is the prayer, and then the axio, the invitation to action. You can forget all that. It's in your note, the handout. It's also a lovely description of it in here. Um, 
So let's sit back and relax and put your papers aside and uh, let's take a few deep, good deep breaths and, uh, and be conscious that we indeed are in the presence of God and uh, we're breathing in God's life and breathing out God's love. And now recognize something in your own life at this time that is somewhat uppermost of concern and that you're going to bring to listen to this text. What is it in your life that needs a word of God? Now, open your heart to the possibility that there might be a word of God in this text for you. Be open to that potential. And the text I've taken is simply from today's first reading it's the uh, Tuesday of the 28th week in ordinary time. It's from uh, the epistle to the Galatians. And what stood out for me was Galatians 5, verse 1, and then verse 6 as well. I will read it through this first time. Just let it come to you as a gift. Let it sink in. And simply notice whatever it is you notice. Whatever speaks to you, whatever you hear, not what does it mean, but rather, what do I hear? Brothers and sisters, for freedom, Christ has set us free. So stand firm and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Just recognize whatever that said, whatever you heard. Let me read it again for you now. And after this reading, I invite you to meditate on the text. And meditation, as I understand it, is like talking to God. Contemplation is more listening to God. So after this reading, just pause and talk to God about what you're hearing as you take this text to heart. Brothers and sisters, for freedom, Christ has set us free. So stand firm and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Take two minutes, three minutes, talk to God about that. Now this exercise can be done alone, of course, or it can be done in community. So since we're doing it in community, a lovely th pause is to turn to a neighbor. We invite you to do this just for a minute or two. You're talking to God about it. Why don't you talk to the neighbor just for a minute or two about what you're hearing for your life, for life from this text. 
We just take two minutes of chat with the neighbor, and then we regather. What were you hearing? Tell the neighbor. Well, you'll be back with the neighbor. We'll give you a minute or two with the neighbor again in about five minutes. So keep a little to say later. Um, we'll regather, and I'm going to read the text again. And if it helps you to look at the text, feel welcome to, but sometimes it's easier to, it depends what kind of a learner you are. Some people need to see the text, but I'm going to read it again, and then we're going to, we're going to try to, a little contemplatio, which I said earlier is more like listening. Sometimes for the contemplation, it's helpful just to focus on a particular word or phrase and say it over and over and kind of let it just sink in and see what is God bringing to your heart uh, and life with this phrase or this word? What do you need to be hearing? So it's not a, we try to put the conversation or our own chattering on hold and listen to God instead. Brothers and sisters, for freedom, Christ has set us free. So stand firm and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but only faith working through love. Now recognize the prayer that God perhaps is inviting from you. What rises up, what prayer rises up from your heart from these reflections? What prayer do you want to bring to God? And is there an invitation, maybe even a decision, something to do in light of these reflections? What might it be? Amen. Let me invite you back to the neighbor just for, we have about five minutes left. Why don't you take two minutes with the neighbor again and Perhaps you might like to share that whatever the prayer was that came to you, maybe a decision. If, it's, if you're uncomfortable sharing that, don't worry about it. Don't bother. Um, just turn to the neighbor. The neighbor very often does want to share something. So the neighbor typically has something to say. So give the neighbor a, sh a chance to tell you how they prayed or what they decided. And then we'll hear some comments from you. And comments about not about just the exercise, but about the book or whatever other issues or quotes or whatever you want to raise. So back to the neighbor for a minute or two, and then we'll regather and wind down. I know I'm interrupting good conversation. It may, maybe it'll continue over our reception. Uh, hopefully maybe you even met a new friend and uh, a new soul friend. The faith is so enriched when we share it. Um, maybe a comment or two somebody wants to make either on the Lexio uh, we welcome that, or if there's some question or comment on the book or whatever you'd like to raise with us, the floor is open for a few minutes. Thank you. Isn't the challenge for all of us these days just shutting down our, ourselves so that we can enter into this? I mean, we have so many more distractions than we've ever dealt with. Yes. Just that whole shutting down from all our devices and things we're reacting to all day. Isn't that what our biggest challenge is now, Tom? It's a huge challenge, but I think we have to face it and try to do it. I don't know how else. And it also is, is good for us. It's, it's a relief for us. It's healthy for us. It's amazing how much conversation is going on now between spirituality and healing. Uh, in the medical, you have, you have people down at Beth Israel uh, taking, reading spirituality seriously as a source of healing and especially increasingly needed in our crazy, busy, tuned-in world. I keep meeting people, I met three in the past week, who said they've taken the, uh, their email off of their iPhone. Do I have that right? Um, 
I just started receiving mine at the, the office, but no, I'm kidding. But, but they'd taken the email, because they said they were just coming out of, no matter where they were, I went to church, came out and immediately they were checking their email, and it's obsessive. So I think we probably need some of these centering, quieting, meditative, contemplative practices, maybe more than ever, just for good health. You know, when people were tilling the fields, uh, I did a little of that as a kid. Last decent day's work I did was on a farm in Ireland about, about 50 years ago. Um, but when you're out there all day on the farm, like whatever it was, sowing potatoes, reaping a crop, sowing seeds or whatever, there was a whole rhythm, and, rhythm to the day. It was a long day. There was no distractions. Finding God in nature was almost inevitable. God was kind of knocking you over the head. The day is gone. So what do we do instead now? We're more, probably more in need of these good practices than ever. Yeah, you want to just comment? I was just gonna add that the practice of silence itself is invaluable these days, given all of our technology. You know, a few years ago I was on a, on a train, true story, and uh, this young woman um, was on her, her phone nonstop and uh, in a kind of an addictive, compulsive way as we see around us so often. Um, and she ran out of juice, and uh, she turned around to the person who was sitting next to her and said, uh, you know, can you talk to me? I just lost my, my cell phone. In other words, there would be too much uncomfortability in that space between. Um, so it underscores, I think, the need for silence as a bona fide practice unto itself, um, and perhaps a, a much needed one. Another comment or two? Just one more, maybe? One more. Uh, Tom and Colleen, thank you very much for this book. It's uh, a wonderful resource, and I look forward to enjoying it. I have a question because you are both master teachers and also accomplished authors, and I've had the benefit of, of benefiting from both of you on both accounts. If you could talk about um, the relationship of your scholarship, doing theology, and also teaching as a type of uh, spiritual practice, because... A vagaris of Ponticus says, to be a theologian is to truly pray, and to, tr to truly be a theologian is to pray. So if you could talk a little bit about the relationship of, of uh, your teaching and your writing as a spiritual practice. Carl. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that uh, this, Thanks, is, Tim. this is one of the reasons, Tim, that um, I... Uh, identify myself as working very deliberately at the intersection of theology and spirituality. Um, I don't know um, any finer place to position oneself as such. Um, I think that theology necessarily uh, has to spring from, from, from lived faith, uh, otherwise we're in the realm of religious studies, um, which is a good realm as well, uh, but it's, it, it's something different. Um, I also identify myself as a practical theologian. Um, and theologians who identify themselves that way very much believe in the intersection of uh, the theory and practice, uh, are interested in the intersection between um, doctrines of the faith and the practices of the faith. Um, and I think there's need for more folks who will identify themselves as practical theologians uh, these days, um, because our best doctrines spring from practice. And if our doctrines are worth their salt at all, they return to practice. So we need lots more folks interested in that connection between doctrine and practice that do theology. Uh, from the teaching standpoint, maybe Tom would like to address that. <laughs> well, and Tim has heard us say this before. I mean, the first 1,200 years of the church's history, the methodology, the way of doing theology was something akin to what we did very briefly for 10 minutes this evening. Uh, it, the Lexio Divina was probably the favored method throughout the whole monastic tradition. In other words, to talk about God, you were required to talk to God. Uh, but then in the 12th century, we invented uh, universities and theology got all dressed up and went off to university. And then there was that separation of spirituality from the academic, from the scholarly. Now, I don't think Aquinas and those great architects of scholasticism ever really intended that, 
but in fact it was one of the consequences that emerged that you could be you could do theology without necessarily ever having it have any kind of influence or impact or consequence for one's own life and of course the enlightenment and the kind of feigned objectivity that came with the enlightenment added to that separation of theory and practice i suppose in my own life i've i've tried to maintain the unity of theory and practice um, i don't do it very well but i know that's the ideal and that somehow our spirituality has to be constantly taken and put to work and since my work is primarily to teach i try to put it to work in how i teach and why i teach and and uh, who I teach, my attitude toward my students and way of relating with them and so on. Uh, I often fall very far short of that ideal, but I think it's imperative and especially people doing theology in the kind of place like we're, where we're doing theology have to have that kind of commitment that that's not in any way a diminishment of one's scholarship. In fact, that's a terrible enlightenment myth that if you are personally involved with the doing of theology that you were somehow not being scholarly and objective and, um, and uh, in, a, in, a, in a deep scholar, you weren't doing deep scholarship. I think uh, Aquinas was right. The more we go on probing, the more regularly and the more likely we are to come to God, um, if we've that kind of openness as we go about it. Um, that's not a very good answer, but I'm going to think a lot more about your question, Tim, and how do I put my spirituality to work in my teaching? You know, just to add a little bit more, I, I think that as we teach um, the tradition, that we really do have a responsibility to teach um, practice, the practices of the tradition, or provide access to the practices of the tradition as part of the content of faith. And I think that that link has been missing for too long. And, and the other thing I would say, speaking theologically, is you know we Catholics in particular talk about the development of doctrine. We talk about sensus fidelium, the sense of the faithful. And I don't know how we actually get at these things, the development of doctrine, or really understand the sense of the faithful without looking more closely and studying the practices of, of people of faith. Because the development of doctrine very much ought be informed by the practices of faithful people. And sensus fidelium remains a theoretical construct unless we study the place of practice as a bona fide theological place of study. I want to thank Tom and Colleen um, for your incredible witness and leadership. Uh, you hand on the faith every day. Thank you very much. And just a quick word, I want to say uh, thank you to the School of Theology and Ministry for co-sponsoring with us, uh, to Paraclete Press and John Sweeney, thank you for being here.